Well, a very warm welcome to everyone this morning as we gather to and on this special day, which is, of course, the Lord's Day. This is Palm Sunday, though, so our service later on will be focused around that great entry in Jerusalem by the Lord Jesus as he entered into the last week of his life, approaching not only death, but also resurrection. I know we've got some visitors with us, and it's great to have you here, especially as we welcome some into our midst as new members, but especially Grace McNichol by profession of faith and baptism. And so it's great that you're able to share on a very special day with her, with the family, but also us as a church family as well. If you're not attached to that uh, baptismal friendship group, family group, and you're here anyway, it's lovely to have you as well. <laughs> And uh, for those who are worshipping at home, it's good to have you wherever you are. This is, you know, every week the Lord brings into our lives his presence for sure. And sometimes he accompanies us through difficult days, but also he invariably accompanies us through wonderful days. And uh, this week we've got a couple of folks who are celebrating their 80th year of life that God has given them. We want to congratulate Wilma uh, Urquhart and also Eleanor Carvel. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say their ages, but it's out now. (laughs) And and so congratulations. Um, And also, I think that uh, the Littles have just made a milestone of 25 years married as well. So congratulations to them as well. And uh, God is good as he gives us so much life. On the other side of things, though, where we want to be praying for a family, as some of you have realized that our friend and brother in Christ, Stuart um, Bob Cowan, has passed away this last week. We want to pray for Stuart and the family. And when funeral arrangements are known, I'll, I'll let us know. It's likely to be at the Hurlitt Crematorium, but I'll make the details known when they become available. Tonight, we're going to come back, and you're all invited to come back and maybe bring friends and family with you. This is an occasion to watch a movie, and it is a dramatized movie. Because of that, some of it's a little bit gritty, There are some uh, scenes where there's kind of domestic squabbling, and and it is quite gritty, so we've kind of put a PG on it. If you're going to bring children, then do be aware that it is a little bit um, real at times. But it's basically the story of a man called Lee Strobel, a real story. He was, by profession, an investigative journalist, but he wanted to ridicule and disprove his wife's faith. So using his skills, he set about doing this. And the film is a dramatization of his real story. And there's a little trailer that we're going to see. presented me with the biggest story of my life. I'm not going to lose my wife and my kids to something that I can't even reason with. And what happened next changed me forever. How can we even talk about historical evidence for the resurrection? The Gospels are filled with contradictions. The empty tomb is based on evidence. And is it evidence your trade? We all bet our lives on something. The question is, what's it going to be? As much as I would like to help out a fellow skeptic, what you're proposing is impossible. Could Jesus survive being spiked to the cross? There is no evidence of anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Just because I write something down and I bury it in the dirt, it doesn't make it true. What I felt was something more real than anything I've ever felt in my life. I'm praying for you. Do you really want to know the truth, or is your mind already made up? Stop blaming me and the church and God and do your job. (laughs) 
No one's ever proven if the shroud is the actual burial cloth of the Christ. Hopefully you'll come back later tonight and bring your friends and family with you. We've got Easter in Rio coming up. Tell us very quickly about Good Friday. Good Friday in the afternoon. Uh, the schools are off, so we are taking advantage of that and inviting families to come and join us here for a Discovering Easter event. There will be various challenges, crafts, activities suitable for all ages. I am We've got a good wee team of helpers, but we could always use some extra people um, to come along and make sure that that happens to give us opportunity to uh, speak to everybody and engage with everybody that comes as well. I have a bundle of flyers. If everybody could take a couple and put them into their neighbours' doors or anybody that you know that's got kids around your street, then that means that we can get this out to people who are not online, not on Facebook as well. So I've got a big bundle of them. If everybody can take a couple and pop them in somewhere that you know that there are kids, then that would be great. Thank you. Easter Sunday, there'll be several activities and let me just encourage you to look for the emails this week and also to our online magazine for these details rather than go through them again today. Can I invite you to stand with me? I'm going to call us to worship with these words from Psalm 24. We'll sing the psalm, but I want us to stand if able. And in these words from Psalm 24, we're going into a time when the psalmist is maybe thinking about the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem. The gates are opening up. The Ark is the very visible, tangible presence of God going into the midst and center of His people. And the psalmist says in these words from Psalm 24, verse 7 through, lift up your heads, O gates. Jerusalem is opening up to the Ark, perhaps coming in. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Well, He's the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who's the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And Jesus, on that last week of His life, entered through these very same gates to battle on our behalf sin, judgment, and death, and to overcome it. Let's sing to his praise.
Let's bow in prayer together. Oh, gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, as we gather with one another, we want to draw close to you because you welcome us. We know the amazing story of how your son Jesus went into Jerusalem on that last week of his life when he went there deliberately and purposely as king, but to conquer not a people, not Romans, not those even flesh and blood who would be against him, but to overcome all evil, to overcome sin and its judgment and the death that are the wages that follow, and then to rise to new life. And we sing again, Lord, on this first day of the week, a reminder that we are in that day of resurrection. And we sing of the Savior, not as one who simply died, but one who rose. He's a living Savior, and we praise our Savior, Jesus. We thank you, God the Father, that you sent your Son to be the Savior of the world. We thank you that through his atoning sacrifice on the cross, that a people who come in faith are forgiven, granted new life. And we praise you, Lord God, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you apply that wonderful gift of atonement to all who believe. And in that a wonderful relationship of love, acceptance, of eternal life with you, the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, may it be that as you welcome us through Jesus, so this day you'd open our hearts that we might welcome you, that our hearts would be so moved by your goodness to us that we could do nothing but not only sing with our lips, but give to you our lives. Be Lord of our lives, we pray. And may it be, Lord, as these ancient doors and gates once opened up to Jerusalem when the people of God triumph, triumphantly uh, ascended that hill into your presence. May it be this day that we would know that through Jesus we are taken up again even into your presence in glory, that we might join those around your throne in singing as a choir your praise because only you are worthy of that praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we pray and come close to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if you're able, we'll sing ye gates.
those of us who have become what we are currently calling Newton Mern's New Church temporarily. Uh, we are currently an independent church, and it's been a great delight to those of us who have been part of this new beginning to know that now we have um, formally 129 members, and today we're going to welcome some of those who we haven't perhaps welcomed formally before who have joined us, but they had professed faith in other places at other times, and so they will not be professing faith today, but it will be our first chance to greet those who were not previously members of Maxwell, who became members of the new church, but who have come amongst us at different times and in different ways, and I'll say more of that in a moment or two. But we will become formally 130, because in a moment also we're going to hear by profession of faith, uh, Grace McNichol, and by baptism as well, her entry into our church life as a new member. And so in a moment or two, I'm going to invite Grace forward to share with us something of how she came to this place. But let me say, first of all, a little bit about profession of faith and about baptism, just so that we're all very clear what it is that we're doing here. When the New Testament church kind of exploded into life after Pentecost, and you hear something of this in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, and it had been promised to them that they should go to Jerusalem and wait and that they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and rested upon them like tongues of fire. And Peter stands up, and he begins to preach in the power of this Holy Spirit that has come upon them. And as he preaches, those who are hearing hear the truth of the gospel of God, and they ask, what should we do? And he says, well, you should repent and be baptized. And repenting is really a kind of fancy Bible word, church word, for turning. In the Old Testament, it meant literally when you, in Hebrew, the word was shuv, and when you shuved, what you did was you literally turned physically in a direction. In the New Testament, in Greek, it's metanoia, and metanoia not only means something of a physical nature, but more particularly your mindset, your heart, your motivations, that which you don't see so visibly. And so basically, when Peter's saying to the people, you should repent, he's telling them that their whole beings, as it were, should be turned, turned from and turned to, turned from whatever God or so-called God they were worshiping to turn to the one true living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To turn from whatever empty vacuum void some of them might have had, where they might have, in, I don't think they would have used this term in these days, but if they called themselves an atheist or some kind of agnostic, Peter's saying you turn from that, an empty, vacuous way of thinking to the one true living God, your Creator, and in Jesus, your Redeemer. So, in, in repenting, we turn from whatever to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also, we turn from whatever then drives us and motivates us, what is far from God's ways and His will. And when it's far from God's ways and His will, we use another weak word in the Bible, and we call that sin. We repent. We turn away from our sin, from the ways that are not of God, the will that's not of God, and we turn to His ways, His loving ways, His law, His loving law. And so, Peter says, repent and be baptized. And to do that, repenting takes a very real trust. It takes a very real trust, a trust in God. Because what we're doing is giving up what we see around us, what other people are doing around us, what has been our patterns of life to this point. We're giving that up and we're taking in trust God's lordship over us, Jesus' salvation for us, the promise of life now and eternal life even to come. That's, that's faith. And then committing to walk that faith day by day, repenting day by day, turning every day from the temptation to go back to whatever was before, to walk with our God, putting away the temptation to turn back to our will, our ways, or whatever anyone else would impose upon us to follow day by day God's will, His way. This is what, in a sense, we're going to see and hear. We're going to hear in the vows that are undertaken when we hear Grace speaking about how Jesus is her Lord 
and her Savior, but it's also what we're going to see in baptism. And I just want to say a very brief word about that, because you see, when the apostle Peter stood and said, you know, you, you, let me tell you the gospel, and they said, we're cut to the heart, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. What he was about to do was take water and physically, dramatically show the gospel with an action, with a sign. And that's what baptism is. Baptism is a physical sign. And it points us away from ourselves to God. It points us to the grace of God and the promises of God and the certainty of that to all who believe. And so, water is such a good sign Water washes away dirt, we know that, and so therefore it's a sign of how through Jesus and His cross, He washes away our sin through the cross. Water is such a good sign because you can't live without water. It's a sign, therefore, a good sign of how on the third day He rose from the dead and how everyone who believes in Him is united to Him, not only in His death, but in that glorious resurrection. It's a sign that is so good because we need water to live. It's a sign that by the Holy Spirit, He renews us, and so wonderfully. And you need water every day to be refreshed and just to operate. And it's a sign of how the Holy Spirit, therefore, having come upon us when we were brought to faith, now refreshes us and revives us day in and day out in order to help us walk the way He calls us to walk. And as Peter said, at Pentecost, that this is what was promised by the prophet Joel, these new times. As Jesus had said, the Holy Spirit will baptize you, and then we see in the story of Pentecost how the tongues of fire come down. There's no better way of distributing this sign than in a similar way of pouring upon those who profess faith visibly, that water, that pouring upon them the sign of that Holy Spirit who came upon them and rested upon them even at Pentecost. And so, this is a great sign. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not where we are brought into relationship with God. No, in fact, Grace is so wonderfully clear about that. In fact, in my conversation with Grace, she just put it so well. If I might, I'd hope I'm not stealing her thunder, but she basically said, no, I want to make public what has happened in private. I want to make public what is personal. And that's so right. And so in a moment or two, what we're going to do is signal publicly, visibly, what has happened personally, privately, invisibly, as God has brought grace to himself and to Jesus, her son. So I'm going to ask his son. I'm going to ask Grace to come forward and share with us something of her story to this point. Hi, I'm Grace. I'm 18. I'm an S6 in Mearns Castle High School. I've grown up in the church and in a Christian home, so I've always called myself a Christian from a young age, but did not understand or commit myself to Jesus until God showed me who he was. I always felt as though God has been near to me, going to church and being surrounded by those who live their life faithfully to God, but I never intentionally drew myself closer to him. God has revealed his love to me, and the reality of Jesus' death is the, on the cross has become clear. I'm so thankful to my parents, my grandparents, my family, my cousins, who have raised me and shown me to know the love of God and the gift of grace he so freely offers. I'm so thankful for the support of my SU and youth leaders who have taught me through any questions I had or even just to listen to what I had to say to those whose faith is an example to me that I can look up to or ask questions about. I'm so grateful for my friends that I've made in youth and in school who have been such an encouragement to me as it can be uncommon now to be surrounded by so many young people who seek to know Jesus and I pray that we would continue to build each other up and help grow our faith in Jesus. Throughout my life, going to SU camps, youth nights and Bible studies and praying had all built up to a point where I was so overwhelmed at God's love for me and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross I could not go on without asking Jesus into my life and seeking the righteousness and kingdom of God. So I came to God in prayer one night, my heart filled and vulnerable with his great love, and asked for his forgiveness that I desperately needed. Through faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I gave my life to him. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. From with the heart one believes and is justified, 
and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. God has shown his love for me by freeing me from my sin and teaching me through study of, of his word to live my life in obedience to him. My heart began to change and my desire was to be with God, going deeper into his word and intentionally growing in spiritual maturity. Being in a church my whole life, I think it had been normalized to hear the amazingness of Jesus and the hope and love he gives, but I never want to take for granted his love, forgiveness and goodness that we do not deserve to know. God showed his love for us, for that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My hope is in the Lord, because he's washed away my sin and made way to eternal relationship with my Father. I still have questions, and there might not be answers that I can know right now, but I can trust that my God is always good. I thank God for being so patient and persistent in me. He did not leave my side even when I did not know him. He stayed with me and showed me the way to him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He has taught me to love others for he loved them first. He has taught me to forgive others for I have been to forgiven. I give what I am to others because he gave everything. I gave my life to Jesus because he already gave his. For by grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. I pray that I would play my part in God's plan and that he could share his great love through me to everyone that I meet and that I would put my trust in him and follow him no matter where I find myself. I'm not afraid of the future with the security and assurance I have in Jesus. I can trust that he will be faithful and guide me even though I will make mistakes. Our sin is great, but his love is greater still. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. T today, I want to make public what I already know personally, that I believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Thank you. Grace, thank you for being so open. And on that day of the book of Acts, when Peter preached, somehow or other, several thousand people said, we believe. And they made that known publicly, as you have done today. And you are joining with many who have professed faith in Jesus, not only today, here, but through the centuries, right back as far as we can Im even imagine. So I, you've actually covered what I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you two questions that you know. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? I do. On the basis of this profession of faith, I'm going to now baptize you. Would like to, do you want to put your paper down? Grace McNichol, I baptize you in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you this day and forevermore. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you. May he turn his countenance upon you and bring you his peace. Amen. I'm going to invite Jacob to come forward and to say a few words. Grace. I want to put to you these questions. I want to put to you these questions, and we have discussed and invite you to these responses, which you are happy to make. Do you promise to follow Jesus Christ in your daily life? With God's help, I will seek to follow Christ, and in listening to God's word, Sharing in the Lord's Supper, praying, I will seek to go ever closer to him as the years pass. Do you promise to be a faithful member of the Christian community? With God's help, I will share in the worship and service of the church, and in this I will give generously of what I am and what I have. Do you promise to take your part in God's mission in the world? With God's help, I will 
I will witness to Christ wherever I find myself, putting my trust and hope in him as I serve him by word and action in his world. Why don't I pray? Father, it is a wonderful, wonderful morning that we are able to gather here and celebrate with grace as she stands before us and professes her trust and faith in you, Lord. Lord, we heard from Grace's testimony some of the things that have led up to this stage, Lord, and we give thanks for all those people and things that were involved in this path that has led her here. Lord, we give thanks for her involvement in SU, both camps and at school and in other activities, Lord, for her leaders, for her friends, for the people who have come alongside her and challenged her and let her ask questions, Lord. It's a wonderful thing that she has been able to do, to go away to these events and be challenged and hear your words told and preached. Lord, we pray for Grace as she goes and continues to do SU stuff, and particularly as she goes to base camp to be trained, as she will have an opportunity to be a leader for those coming to camps next, an opportunity to share her faith with younger children, an opportunity to tell them about the wonderfulness that is you, Lord, and how the great and this great change in her life. Lord, we pray and give thanks for the family that Grace has had, that has surrounded her and cared for her and guided her, that has brought her to church and has been alongside her in every step, from parents, grandparents, to siblings and cousins. Lord, we give thanks for all them. And Lord, as Grace now continues, we pray that she will know that she, they are still alongside her in all that she does, and that they are praying and walking alongside her in her faith. And Lord, we give thanks for the church family that has surrounded Grace as she has grown. Lord, we give thanks for leaders and youth leaders and for Scott in his faithful teaching over Grace's life here. And we pray, Lord, that she will now feel so a part of that church family that she will want to serve and serve the surrounding community to be the light of Jesus in this community. Lord, we pray for Grace as she goes to uni, as she perhaps has to find a new church, a new place to settle, Lord, that you, we pray that you'll be able to commit to her and she'll be able to keep and support, be supported as she keeps these vows that she's made today and that she will find brothers and sisters in Christ no matter where she is, who she can join together in fellowship. Lord, it is a wonderful day that we are able to gather here this morning. And Lord, I th we thank you so much that we are able to share with it. Lord, be with us today. Amen. Do you have enough hands? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> You want to put that and come back right. I'm going to ask Grace to come back. And if you come back, Grace, and if you just take a wee space there. Some who have just recently come to us and uh, asked for church membership with us, and we've been receiving them into that membership, are with us today, and some of them are willing to come to the front and be greeted. And so let me just uh, invite Ricky and Karen Wu to come forward. They originally pressed professed faith out back in Hong Kong, and as they come forward also, we would be welcoming Asa and Willie Lai, who also professed faith in Hong Kong, but have, um, are not with us this morning. Katrina McGuigan actually professed faith within a Church of Scotland environment, and we're delighted that Katrina has become one of our members. David Hargreave is, met, is known to many of us who came out of Maxwell. He'd been around us for 20 or 27 years, in fact, but he'd actually never uh, become a member, but originally came out of the Anglican church where he himself was a member. And Jackie Barnett, uh, independent church, come on Jackie, come forward. And uh, we're delighted that Jackie has come to us from Tron Church. Catherine Anwar is somewhere there. Catherine uh, is out of the United Free Church where she first professed faith uh, down in uh, Cathcart area. And Barry and Janet Clark professed faith many years ago and worshipped in a church of Scotland laterally, and we're delighted that they also have become members with us. We welcome all, and I want to invite our elders to come forward and to bring what we would call in rather formal language the right hand of fellowship as we welcome them into the congregation. So come on, elders, come as quickly as you can from wherever you are, and we'll welcome these folks.
if you'd like to sit down. Grace, you can sit down as well. <laughs> One of the... One of the things that we've just seen evidence of is, and that is that our little congregation here have any monopoly on the grace of God that's held out through Jesus. He is at work in so many different parts of his kingdom and his church, and we're just one tiny wee part, and so it's delightful for us to play that little bit in that bigger church, that universal church that is not only in our generation throughout this country and other countries, but back through the centuries. <clears throat> and we are just this little part in this moment, and it's wonderful to be that by God's grace. I asked our grace what song or praise item that she might want to have sung today, and she picked this song, Man of Sorrows. So let's stand and sing together, Man of Sorrows, what a name, and we have a great Savior in this man, Jesus.
there's any uh, young people who are going off to your different groups, this is your moment to go. Short groups today, I think. And uh, as they head off, Martin Smith is going to come and lead us in our prayers of thanks and intercession. Just as the young people are leaving, take a moment to be still and just to quieten our hearts. We've been reminded this morning of the glory of God, of His presence. There's a, a song that we sometimes sing, be still for the presence of the Lord, be still for the power of the Lord, be still for the glory of the Lord. Let's just be still this morning as we respond to the amazing reality that the self-existent one, the God who made everything, is here with us, and his son died on the cross. Let's come to him in prayer. God, our Father, it's difficult for us to know where to start, but our hearts come to you this morning with praise and adoration again. We thank you for the reality of your presence with us and your power and your glory. We thank you for the truths we've just been singing about, about what Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you that we can affirm that we have a faith and a trust in these things. But Father, surely our only response this morning should be to come to you and ask that we might know more of your presence, more of your power in our life, more of your glory. And of course, knowing more of your glory, because we cannot see you as you are in this life and live. You are too glorious for that, but we see you in Jesus Christ. And we come to you and pray this morning that you would help us to know more of him. And Father, we pray that it might be an experiential knowledge. We pray that it might be a knowledge that, as Scott said, takes us from living life one way to living life another way to take our focus from this world to the focus on the world to come, to take our focus on living from ourselves and make it a focus on living for you and for your glory. Father, teach us more of Jesus. Give us a hunger and a thirst to know him more. Give us a desire to study your word and to spend time and effort and energy seriously in your presence asking that you would speak to us from your word. Give us a passion to pray, both on our own and with others, and collectively as a church, that we might may know, may know more of your presence. We are a relatively new congregation. We rejoice in new members who have come and joined with us in recent months. We rejoice in the profession that grace has just made. And Father, I was struck as she was speaking, and as I saw the emotion, I was struck afresh by the palpable, tangible presence of you, the Almighty God in our midst. Lord God, I come and pray that you would take those of us who once, long time ago, professed faith to a position where again we look and we reassess and we come and we reprofess our faith again. We confirm that we still believe, that we still are those who want to repent and turn our attention away from this life but to you, to turn our attention to Jesus. Oh Lord God, help us to have this fresh sense this morning, this very real sense of your presence. And Father God, we pray this for your glory because unless we are a people who are being changed by your Holy Spirit within us, we will not reflect Jesus in this society the way we ought to. And so we ask that you would touch us with power, the power of your Spirit, to transform us to be more like Jesus, to give us something of his loveliness, of his gentleness, of his meekness, of his kindness, of his forgiving spirit, of his servanthood, Oh, Father God, we pray for your power 
to continue the work that you have begun and that one day you will complete. But we pray that you would continue to change us to make us more like him. And Father, we pray that as a result of that, that the light of the glory of God will shine from our midst. And we pray that others will see and be drawn to you. And we pray that they will come to find out what it is that makes our lives so bright. And we can point them to you. Father, we want to thank you for your many blessings, not just for this relationship we have with you. We have to start with that. But we come to you and thank you for the many good gifts you give us in life. And we just take a moment to reflect on the many blessings that we have. Water, food, clothing, income, homes, clothing, friendship, so many things. And we could go on and on. You have blessed us richly in this part of the world. And we give you our thanks and we pray that you would not let us take these things for granted. We thank you too for answered prayer and we we rejoice to see Brian with us this morning and thank you for answered prayer as he had to undergo a second procedure. And it's with that confidence that you're the God who answers prayer that we come and pray for a young lady like Emily. And we pray that somehow you would draw close to her and her family and that at this point in time you would bring your healing mercies into that situation. We pray for others that we may know one who comes to mind is our friend Sue's husband, John Anderson. And Father, if there are others that we think of who have significant health issues and who desperately need your help, we ask that as we bring them to you quietly, you would hear and answer as we know you have already answered on behalf of Brian. Father, we pray for this world in all its mess. It is very easy for us to accept the truth of evil in this world because of sin, because we see its consequences. And there are so many parts of this world that need our prayers and so many people going through so many difficult situations that we do not have time to enumerate them this morning, but we bring them to you collectively, knowing that you know the situations and the needs far more than we do anyway. And we ask, Father God, that the grace and mercy that we have received might continue to be shown in this age of grace and favor to the people in this world who are going through hard and difficult experiences at this time. We pray for wisdom, for leadership. But Father, above all, we pray for more light in the church. We pray for more of you in your people. We pray for a light to the nations that will truly draw people to you. Because, Father, the only hope for the, for the salvation of the nations and for the change from evil to good is the bringing of people of many tribes and tongues and nations to you through Jesus Christ. So we commit this world to you. And again, just in the moments of quietness in our own hearts, we bring to you situations that you have put in our hearts that we need to pray for. Father, remember our world. Continue to be gracious and continue to reveal your presence, we pray. And Father, finally, as we come to look at your word through whom you have revealed so much to us already, we pray that as Jacob opens the pages, you would anoint him, that you would speak to our hearts and minds, that you would change us, and above all, you would help us to be a people who constantly sing Hosanna and not a people who sing that today and like the crowds of old change their mind a week later. Father, pour your spirit upon Jacob and speak through him, we pray, that we might hear not him, but your word for us today and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, uh, please, if you could, turn to Mark 11, uh, verses 1 to 11, is where we're going to read. Uh, 
Mark chapter 11. Now, when they drew near to to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. wonderful that we can be here this morning, not only celebrating Palm Sunday, but celebrating a baptism and other members joining our church. And this morning, I want us, um, as we look at this passage, to put our detective hats on. Now, on the screen behind me, there are a couple of famous detectives, hopefully, Um, some for a couple of different generations. Perhaps you think of yourself more as a Sherlock, maybe more of a Poirot. Myself, I'm more Scooby-Doo. And as you imagine these detectives, that's what I want us to do. I want us to put the deer stalker hat on this morning as we're going to look for clues in Mark's gospel. And we're going to look for clues about Jesus. And we're trying to uncover the mystery that Mark has left for us. Now, I think there are three things that these clues are going to lead us to. And the first one is going to appear on me behind. Here's the first. The Lord has come. The Lord has come. Now... I may have mentioned this before, I studied geography at university, which in my humble, humble opinion, is the greatest degree you can do. Um, And I will argue anyone. And behind me, you'll see a couple of uh, snapshots from my time, me looking very dapper in my graduation with one Jamie Taggart next to me. Uh, Also me up to my waist in a river. There was some reason I did that. I'm still not entirely sure. Um, And I studied geography for many reasons. But some of them are because I like maps. I like studying places. I like studying about them, learning about them, learning all about them. But when we read the Bible sometimes, we can look at the places and we can kind of skip over them sometimes. They provide background info. They provide setting. They provide information. They've got funny sounding names that we perhaps don't know how to say. We've never been to them, perhaps. But the problem is if we do that sometimes, we can sometimes miss the clues that the Bible is providing, the things that it is telling us. And Mark is telling us stuff right from the start in verse 1. They drew near to Jerusalem. We know where they're going. They're going to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. So, if you know your Bibles, you probably have heard of the Mount of Olives, if you know the Gospels particularly. And if you see behind me, there is a map. This is describing the route that Jesus had taken into Jerusalem with these points of interest mentioned. Now, the Mount of Olives, as I've said, is probably familiar from the New Testament, but is also familiar in the Old Testament. It actually gets a pretty big shout out in the Old Testament, in the prophets. I'm going to read to you from Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 3 to 4. Don't worry about trying to find it. Um, It should be on the screen behind me. So this is Zechariah 14, verses 3 to 4. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. Zechariah, hundreds of years before Jesus was walking the earth, well, he was looking forward to the day that the Lord would come, that the Lord would come and fight the Jerusalem's enemies and free her from all her enemies. 
He tells us exactly where the Lord is going to come from in order to fight his enemies. It's going to come from the Mount of Olives. He's going to come from the east, from Bethphage and Bethany. So when we read Mark's gospel and see, okay, Jesus, Mount of Olives, Bethphage and Bethany, we could just go, okay, that's the direction he's traveling from. That's where he's coming from. Or actually, we could see the clue that Mark has left for us. The, that the Lord is coming, that something big is happening, that the Lord is coming to fight for his people, to fight the enemies of his people. Now, how can I be so sure of that? Well, if you still have Mark 11 open, have a look at verse 3. What does Jesus say to his followers? If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. So it's another clue. It is the Lord on the Mount of Olives who has come from the Mount of Olives. It is the Lord that has come to Jerusalem. Jesus is God himself who has come to fight this battle for his people, to free them from their enemies. Mark's given us some clues. So that's the first thing, that Jesus, that the Lord has come. And here's the next one. The king has come. These clues about Jesus, well, they carry on into verses 4 to 8, don't they? So keep with me as you read them. They find this colt tied out in the street. They ask for it, and surprisingly, they get, are given it. But then what happens when they start putting the cloaks on top so Jesus can ride? And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Now, that doesn't sound very impressive to us because recently, and very recently, we've had a coronation. We've had a royal procession. And now probably when you think of a royal procession, you think of the coronation. You think of King Charles and his gilded chariot, no, uh, and his gilded coach being pulled by horses, surrounded by soldiers, surrounded by bands who are probably playing God Save the King, surrounded by people covered in jewelry and gold, carrying swords and all their finery. It's very over the top. It's very impressive, perhaps, with all the pomp and circumstance that goes with a royal procession in the UK. But what about this royal procession? Here's Jesus riding on a donkey, and all the people are hacking down bits of leaf and bits of trees from bushes around the road and throwing it in front of him, taking off their jackets and throwing it on the road in front of him as well. In comparison, that doesn't sound as impressive, does it? It does, sounds pretty rubbish, but it's not. Because you see, this is a royal procession, and the reason we know that again is, well, Zechariah told us, good old Zechariah comes to the rescue again. And again, listen to what he said hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, when he was talking about the day that God's king would come to God's people. This is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. See, the clue's there again, isn't it? The king of God's people is going to arrive on a donkey. He doesn't look amazing and spectacular as perhaps, but when he comes, there he is. And then in Mark, which, uh, Mark 11 verse 10, the crowds, the crowds recognize this. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. They recognize him. They see Jesus riding on this donkey, and they don't go, it's not that impressive, it's a bit rubbish. No, they recognize who he is. They see and they think, this is the king we've been waiting for. He's here at last. They're excited. They're in amazement. They're overjoyed. The clues are all here, telling us that Jesus, the promised king, has come. They only, don't only tell us that he's come, but they also tell us perhaps of something of the kind of king that he is going to be. We would perhaps maybe expect for a warrior king to arrive in a grand chariot, maybe with many horses, uh, with his sword and his spear and his shield at his side, ready to fight the battle. But that's not how Jesus arrives, is it? The Jews were expecting that, that someone would come in and conquer the Romans. But Jesus didn't. He arrived 
on a young donkey. Jesus wasn't the kind of king people expected him to be. He wasn't the kind of king that they perhaps thought would be. But he was the king that would bring joy and righteousness and victory by living a lowly life and dying a humble death. Jesus would be enthroned as king just a few days later on the cross. Mark gives us the clues that the king has come and he's not necessarily the kind of king that you would expect. So the Lord has come, the king has come. And here's the third one. The final clue in our story can be found in the shouts of those who followed Jesus behind him and introduced him in a way. And they tell us that the saviour has come. Listen to verse 9 and 10 from Mark 11. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now, if you've ever been stood in a big crowd of people, you can know that the noises that they're making can tell you what's happening. If they're going, ooh, ah, they're maybe watching fireworks. If they're cheering, clapping, and singing Flower of Scotland, Scotland's just scored a try. The booing and hissing, that try's just been disallowed. Not holding on to that. The sounds of the people tell us what is happening, and it's the same here. And we sang this word that they are shouting, Hosanna. Now, if you have a big, heavy Bible with lots of footnotes, which I know at least one person does, um, there might be a little footnote at the bottom. It might tell you what this word means. And it says, and in mine it said, Hosanna. A Hebrew expression meaning save, which became an exclamation of praise. You can also find it in verse 10. Now, it's not a word that we perhaps use day to day. But you see, when the people were shouting Hosanna to Jesus, they were shouting a word that meant save. Whether they realized it or not, they were calling on Jesus to save him. That's the noise that accompanied Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey well, how can we be so sure that's right? That's what the people are expecting from Jesus. Well, because there's another clue. It's very kind of Mark to give us all these different clues. It makes life very easy. There is another quotation from the Old Testament, not from Zechariah this time, but from the Psalms, from Psalm 118. One of the things that the crowds cry out as Jesus arrives comes from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. Let me read it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This is a song that the pilgrims would have sang as they walked to Jerusalem, as they climbed the mountains up to Jerusalem to the festivals. They would call on the Lord to save them. They would call on God. And then this, well, this is what the people in these Verses in Mark 11, this is what they're doing. They're asking Jesus to save them. And they sing it about Jesus as he arrives. Mark gives us all these clues to tell us that Jesus has come to save. Do you see that in the triumphal entry? The story of Jesus going into Jerusalem on that donkey gives us all the clues that we need. It gives us all the clues to who Jesus is and why he has come. He is the Lord who has come. He is the King who has come. And he is the Saviour who has come. And the challenge is, well, what do we do with that information? How will we respond to that information? That's the question Mark leaves us with. And wonderfully, that's the question we got to hear Grace answer. We got Grace to tell us how she knows that Jesus is her King, is her Lord, is her saviour, how she accepted Jesus as the one to lead her in all that she does in life. And it's wonderful that we got to celebrate with her this morning. But what about the rest of us? Do we need to check ourselves, to remind ourselves, to reaffirm this, to make sure that this is our attitude to Jesus? Are we letting him be the king in our lives? 
Are we ready to bow the knee and say to Jesus, you know, you're in control? Or are there still some things that we don't want to hand over to Jesus and go, you know what, that's not a problem, or that's a problem I can fix? But Mark has shown us that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, Jesus is Savior. So will we accept him that way? Why don't I pray? Heavenly Father, we give thanks as we gather here this Palm Sunday. As churches around the globe will be celebrating that triumphal entry as well. Lord, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you for everything he came to do, for everything he came to be. And we thank you for this passage that shows his great arrival into Jerusalem and exactly what kind of king and lord and saviour he came to be. Help us to think about that in our own lives and the way that we respond to Jesus, maybe for the first time or maybe for the hundredth time. Help us grow to, a, to obey him more and to love him more because he is our king. Lord, we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. I'd like to invite the band back up and we are going to sing again.
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the exquisite, unfathomable love of God the Father and the powerful, intimate presence and power of God the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Please, if you can stay, we've got refreshments coming at the hatches at the back. And remember, tonight, come back with family, friends for the film. It's a, an earlier start. It's a 6.30 start so that we can get the film uh, fully uh, finished. And then you get a chance to stay out and have time to chat about what's been seen. 